one thing I wanted to make sure to bring up is what some people might consider to be an elephant in the room, which is the influence of the pharmaceutical industry. And what I'm curious to know is if you have experienced, like how you have felt um, influenced, and maybe you're, you're a unique case because you were never really um, under the spell, so to speak, of the narrative, but what have you witnessed or, or what are you aware of in terms of how pharmaceutical companies are able to influence the prescribing practices of psychiatrists? So when I was, again, a junior trainee, I took a small amount of money from Roche Pharmaceuticals, who make diazepam, um, to go to a conference. And in, in, in those days, no one else was going to pay me to go to a conference. Uh, and, and I wanted to go, or my friends and colleagues were going. And I will always have a soft spot for Roche. And, and you know, I think that's... And, and so doctors will tell you that they're not influenced by being given things. They absolutely are. They absolutely are. We all are. Um, and so when, uh, when we hear that pharmaceutical companies are paying doctors or psychiatrists to write papers or to give talks for them um, or, or anything else, we, you know, we, we really need to take all that information with a huge pinch of salt because it will not be objective. It will be, it will reflect the interests of the person who's paying the piper. Mm. Yes. And I know that um, in the UK, you use the ICD, the International Classification of Disease, to make diagnoses. And in the US, um, psychiatrists use the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. And so I'm not as familiar as, with how um, new diagnostic criteria are added to the ICD as I am with the DSM. But one of the extremely controversial facts about the DSM committee which is consists of about 27 doctors who for lack of a better way to put it vote on whether a condition should be added or a criterion should be added to the new editions of the dsm um, the numbers are that about 68 percent of them have taken money from drug companies and so we see this influence both in the foundation of diagnosing as well as in which drugs are prescribed and maybe it's obvious but just in case people are you know it would help to to say this for listeners the reason that it's beneficial for a pharmaceutical company to influence psychiatrists is number one if you can influence psychiatrists to broaden diagnostic criteria then you increase the number of people who could be taking the drug. And if you, of course, influence a psychiatrist to want to prescribe your drug in particular, you know, as a pharmaceutical company, then again, you just kind of elevate yourself in the competition and make it more likely that more people will take your drug. And so again, maybe this is obvious to listeners, like why this is a conflict of interest, but I just wanted to explain that in case it's not. And the other thing I think too is that it seems to me that psychiatrists are probably um, desirable targets for pharmaceutical companies, particularly because the diagnosis can be made very easily. Um, I think it's the least objective type of diagnosis in all of medicine, given that you can just listen to someone talk about their symptoms or observe their behavior and, and diagnose them. You don't have to do any kind of objective testing. So um, psychiatric diagnoses are highly malleable, aren't they? Mm -hmm. and, and you can also go out there and persuade people to understand their distress and problems in different ways. You know, that's uh, basically what happened over the 1990s. People in the 1980s, people had anxiety. In the 1990s, they were told, no, it's not anxiety, it's depression, because now we've got antidepressants to sell. Uh, and then that very same distress gets um, gets packaged and marketed uh, later on in the 90s and the noughties as 
either bipolar disorder or ADHD or a variety of mm. other sorts of, uh, of things in order to sell, you know, new drugs. Mm. And it's so interesting. And again, just so listeners are aware, the United States is, is one of two countries where pharmaceutical companies are allowed to advertise directly to the consumer. And I feel like for people who have grown up in the U.S., steeped in this culture, it's just so normal that they see these advertisements on the television saying, like, ask your doctor about this antidepressant. Um, and it's, I, I think it's important to realize, like, that's not actually normal in the rest yeah. of the world. When, when, I, when I come to the U.S. and I see them... I, I, I find them really shocking. I mm. find it really, really shocking to see a, a, a drug advertised, a psychiatric drug in particular, advertised on the television. And that's because it, so much else goes with a psychiatric drug. So many messages about what sort of person you are, what, what, what it means to be a person in the first place. You know, if you're advertising an antidepressant, you are making a statement that you know, being unhappy, being depressed is, a, is, is an abnormal state. It's a mm. disease. So you're making an existential statement. Right. You're not just advertising a drug. Mm. And it's an existential statement that I think is, is potentially really harmful and misleading and has, you know, has ended up with millions of people taking drugs that are probably aren't doing them any good mm. and are, are stopping them from doing the things that might, might be more helpful. 